the fallout from WA's snap lockdown. Our city now a ghost town. Travellers shut out from the east, a police investigation launched, and Perth's ring of steel. But tonight, there are no new COVID cases. I know it has been difficult, and I know it may have been frustrating. Plus, outrages neighbours of patient zero are left in the dark as infected waste discovered on their doorstep. Nurses push for 24-hour testing clinics as thousands brave the heat to get checked. Why the Premier has refused calls for schools to open for children of essential workers. New shopping limits to stop panic buying as trading hours are extended. And amid the crisis, firefighters injured and seven homes destroyed in a bushfire emergency in Perth's east. This is Nine News Perth with Michael Thompson. Good evening. We made it through our first 24 hours of lockdown with streets empty, schools and workplaces deserted across Perth. And the good news that so far, no more West Australians have tested positive for COVID-19. The only places with crowds today were our COVID clinics with thousands of people lining up from early this morning to be swabbed. These are live pictures from our news helicopter of the Claremont drive through facility. As you can see, long lines remain as West Australians follow the health advice and get themselves tested. We have reporters covering every angle of this unfolding crisis tonight as dual investigations are launched into what went wrong in quarantine. Almost deserted on an otherwise perfect beach day. Playgrounds shut, streets cleared. The beginning of a five-day lockdown prompted by a single COVID case that's driving fear in the community. Fear that's hopefully misplaced. Overnight, Western Australia has recorded no further local cases of COVID-19. What started with a security worker at the Four Point Sheraton testing positive on Saturday evening... The advice is he has the UK strain. We don't know from which um, person in the hotel he acquired it from. ..is now a police investigation into how it could happen. It is not a criminal investigation, but we must know what went on. We need to establish very clearly not only what happened at the hotel, but his movements, when, where and with whom. One potential failing seems obvious. The Health Department, unsure if it was told, the quarantine worker had phoned in sick on December 28. If the security company's notified, yes, they will notify us. And did they? Um, as far as, well, I'd have to check that. So far, the Maylands man in his 20s has been traced to 66 people he was in contact with leading up to testing positive. The closest contacts on the list are so far clear of the virus. But there's a long way to go and the next 48 hours will be crucial because coronavirus has an average five to seven day incubation period. If they're still coming up as negative, that, that would be a good sort of sign that this person wasn't a particularly effective spreader. But anxiety grows for some doing quarantine inside the Ground Zero City Hotel. This woman doesn't trust the system in place. Um, if I get it, I'm going to die. That's, that's just a simple fact. Um, I, I've got every risk factor except for age and it's quite a concern. Yanti Ardi has asked to be moved because she fears the potent UK strain is circulating through the hotel's air conditioning. The advice we have is the air conditioning system uh, is uh, safe and there is no evidence uh, that there is any problem with the air conditioning. It was the Premier's snap five-day lockdown that the Home Affairs Minister, Peter Dutton, had a problem with. In terms of an elimination strategy, uh, it, it, you know, it might be a great sort of you know, political slogan, but it, it's not a realistic approach to this virus. Uh, you'll send businesses broke. He shouldn't be criticising when we're doing the task he should be performing. And Gary Ed said there'll be a review of how the coronavirus got out of the hotel. Yeah, on top of that police investigation into how it got out of the hotel behind me, there will be an, a review by a former chief health officer. He'll look at some of the protocols in place. One issue that keeps coming up is how a hotel quarantine worker can have a second job. The recent case, of course, was a uh, rideshare driver. So that's going to be looked into. But don't, don't uh, be surprised if the Premier announces next week that there will be a pay rise for those hotel quarantine workers to disencourage them from holding second jobs. In news just hand as well, the Defence Minister, Linda Reynolds, has agreed to supply more defence personnel to guard hotels like this one's now at the centre of our latest pandemic pressure point. Michael? That is some good news. Gary, thank you. 
Residents of the Maylands apartment complex are outraged tonight, saying they were left in the dark about the outbreak. Mayor Edgerton Warburton, you've spoken with neighbours of Patient Zero. Michael, these people share a wall with that infected worker and his housemates. They say they only learned about the outbreak online. They weren't prioritised at testing clinics. Some only tested this afternoon. And today, another blow, COVID waste, left on their doorstep. Health officials and police in protective gear. This is what residents at 25 Falkirk Avenue woke up to on Sunday morning as housemates of the infected security guard were whisked away to hotel quarantine. We watched them come up in COVID suits and took them away and just in shock. Yesterday when we saw there's a police in there, we just, how, why? Right, we're, we're just asking, why is there a police? Those questions never answered. Residents telling Nine News they only learnt of the infectious outbreak in their backyard via the news. Mixed emotion. Of course, especially as a mother, I'm scared for my children. The Department of Health have contacted all residents at that complex. Um, we advised them all to go and get COVID tested. And in a further blow, these bags of rubbish belonging to the group left lying in a communal walkway. No one has been up to, to clean around the, the area. So far, 66 close contacts of the worker have been identified. That number is expected to hit 100. 13 have already tested negative, but 11 of those considered high risk have been moved to hotel quarantine. And today, two more potential exposure sites for the man dubbed Patient 903, a grab-and-go convenience store in the CBD. Anyone who visited there on the 27th between 2 and 3 p.m. now required to get tested. All also added Genesis Health and Fitness. The man went to the Belmont gym on Saturday between 9.30 a.m. and midday. But just how the worker became infected with the highly contagious strain without entering a hotel room is still a mystery. It is not a criminal investigation, but we must know what went on. It's clearly not perfect. I mean, we're dealing with a global pandemic. Mia Edgerton Warburton, Nine News. Nurses are pushing for 24-hour testing clinics as thousands of West Australians braved the heat to get checked. Queues stretched hundreds of metres, with health workers pushed to the limit. Making the trip from their infected suburb, Maylands families camping for hours to get a test. What time do we get here? About five? Yeah. Five this morning? Yeah. About five. Yesterday I had about six hours. You did six hours on the line? Uh, yesterday we did, yeah. We all got sent home, unfortunately. Thousands lining up at clinics today, braving the heat to keep WA safe. We've got people standing out in 38, 40 degrees for hours and hours and hours, and it's unnecessary. Nurses now pushing for 24-hour clinics to be instated immediately. You do not want somebody who is potentially infected going to a clinic, they get to the clinic, they stand in line for hours and hours and hours, and at the end of the day, they're turned away, they're told, come back tomorrow, and they've got to do it all again. It's insane. It's a no-brainer. Get those clinics open 24-7. 3,171 West Australians were tested yesterday, many choosing the drive-in option from their air-conditioned cars. We've just both been feeling um, a little bit of a sore throat, runny nose, um, and Amy was actually in the area where the, um, the chat with COVID was. So, yeah, we thought better to be safe than sorry. Others finding novel ways to pass the time. Playing, you know, uh, in the car with the kids. Uh, so we live in the Mayland area, so we thought we'd better come and get tested. In Osborne Park, kind-hearted cafe workers did coffee runs up and down the queues. I bet they were happy to see you with the coffee. Yes. yes. Very happy. Very really happy. Angel. <laughs> but for many, this won't be their only trip to a clinic. One test may not be enough. Uh, some people who who uh, may have been exposed uh, to the virus will still be in the incubation period, can range from one day out to longer than a week even, uh, until tests become positive. Most more than happy to do the right thing. The most logical thing everyone should do, keep WA safe and we'll get back to where we were. And that heat has certainly kept people away from the Perth COVID clinic this evening. It is still 34 degrees out here, but it is, it is expected numbers will grow as it cools down into this evening. If you still need a test, clinics are open until 10 o'clock tonight. And as we go to air, a new pop-up testing clinic has just opened right in the heart of our city's COVID hotspot at the rise in Maylands as part of an effort to keep any potential cases contained to one area. Michael. Jerry, thank you for the update.
The Premier is tonight refusing calls to reopen schools to children of essential workers. Many healthcare workers have been forced to take unpaid leave, some even considering bringing their kids to work. Playgrounds normally filled with back to school buzz, today deserted as term one for thousands of WA students is put on hold. To many, a slightly longer summer holiday, but for some parents, the last minute cancellation triggered a last minute scramble. What am I going to do with the kids? <laughs> it was just all a bit of a shock, really. Larissa Otto and her husband are both radiographers, the mum of three among many essential workers forced to take unpaid leave. I've had to contact my daycare to see if they'd take my oldest, but most daycares have an age limit of five. Just smacks of lack of planning by this government. The Nursing Federation wants schools reopened for parents who can't work from home. Now that's what happened in the Victorian second wave. We don't understand uh, why the government is opening up childcare but closing schools. The Premier today ruling that out. At this point in time it's five days. I'd urge people to uh, work cooperatively and understanding uh, with family members. The ban on home visitors had many thinking babysitters weren't an option. But this afternoon, some clarity. If you're an essential worker and you can't, you don't have anyone to look after your kids, you can't bump them into a childcare centre, you can get someone to come into your home and child mind in your own home. The sudden announcement also created confusion among childcare centres, some shutting down altogether today, only to announce they'll reopen tomorrow to essential workers. School is due to go back next Monday. Parents, for now, making do. Just really hoping this gets lifted after five days. Louise Rennie, Nine News. Major supermarkets have acted swiftly, putting restrictions on dozens of essential items to stop panic buying. Coles and Woolworths have also been given permission to extend trading hours. Elizabeth Creasy's scenes were far less frantic today. Well, Michael, after the chaos we saw at our supermarkets yesterday, shoppers were a lot calmer today and crowd numbers were a lot smaller as well. But our supermarkets are still imposing restrictions on certain items on their shelves, but they will be allowed to open early. Those new opening hours kicking in at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. The panic buying started within minutes of the lockdown announcement. Supermarkets overflowing with shoppers and running out of essential items. This morning there were fears of more of the same as customers began lining up before stores even opened. There's no food in my house, just bad timing. Mostly just here for cat food and a few other essentials. I just need to get like milk and bread because we've just run out. <laughs> for the most part the crowds remained surprisingly small but some items were still selling out fast. And they're really calm, um, you know the numbers are, are, are nowhere near what we thought. So that, that's just really pleasing to see. Yesterday's panic buying prompting the major chains to place limits on basic items. Coles restricting shoppers to one pack of toilet paper and paper towels. Woolworths placing a two-pack limit on the same items. Both supermarkets limiting customers to two packs of dozens of other items, including pasta, tissues, chicken and red meat. And since we've had those limits in place, we've seen things calm down a lot. Supermarkets in the lockdown zone have now been given permission to open an hour early. So customers will be able to do their food shopping from 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. But Perth's shopping centres remain deserted as most retailers shut up shop. Large chains like Maya, Target and Kmart remain open. All customers are now required to use the Safe WA app everywhere, including at supermarkets and takeaway shops from 6am tomorrow. The government bringing forward the date from February 12. Elizabeth Creasy, Nine News. WA's outbreak zone is now protected by a ring of steel. 15 checkpoints across the city, Peel and Southwest, manned by police 24 hours a day. Only essential workers or people needing medical services can enter or leave the lockdown zone. Michael Stamp is at the Two Rocks checkpoint, and Michael, already travellers are being turned away. Michael, more than 20 drivers have been forced to turn around here at this checkpoint in Two Rocks today and head back in the direction they came from. Police telling me that most of the travellers wanted to go camping or visit their holiday homes, but wanting to avoid lockdown for simply those reasons isn't allowed. You must have an essential reason to receive the green light. The checkpoints are back. 
if you don't have an essential reason, you're not coming through. We have in fact this morning turned around some travellers, uh, I understand, that wanted to travel for reasons other than, for instance, holidays. The Perth, Peel and South West now in lockdown. You can only enter these areas to access or deliver essential health or emergency services or to return home. When you try, you'll be met with this, a familiar sight we experienced last year. How are you today? Thank you. And your reason for travel today? Police officers checking where you're going and why. You can't go out of the Perth metropolitan area uh, if you want to tow a caravan and go on a holiday. You must stay within the Perth metropolitan area. Seven checkpoints have been established in the Perth metropolitan area, another eight in the regions. The southwest once again locked out. I went down for my hours exercise on the beach this morning uh, and uh, was the only one there and uh, you know, there's, it's, it's been a packed beach for uh, a month or so now. Shops closed, streets empty. These popular tourist towns and landmarks without their visitors. Hopefully we can get this under control um, by these prompt actions by the weekend and uh, our event schedule and, and normal tourism will return to normal. The G2G pass system used during last year's lockdown will be reinstated for regional borders. Police will also accept a letter from your employer or evidence of a medical appointment. Michael Stamp, Nine News. The north of the state might have escaped lockdown, but our mining industry hasn't been spared. There was confusion whether fly-in, fly-out workers were allowed to travel to site. Kelly Haywood is in the Pilbara tonight. And Kelly, that's now been clarified. Yes, Michael, critical staff are now allowed to fly in and out of the Pilbara, but with many mine sites moving to skeleton crews, the Karratha Airport here is a ghost town. Unsurprisingly, most of the big mining corporations are taking a very conservative approach as a COVID outbreak at one of their facilities could see a multi-million dollar setback. We're equally confident that we've got the right risk management methods in place and should they be required, the sector won't uh, hesitate to use them. Now, mining company Mineral Resources has now repurposed one of its COVID testing sites. It's now giving free access to the public. So, Michael, that is very welcome news for anyone wanting to get tested tonight. That's great news. Kelly, thank you. Well, wearing a mask, a face mask, is now mandatory every time you leave the house, including inside office spaces while exercising and on public transport. And Monica Cost, there are some exemptions. Michael, masks flew off the shelves across Perth yesterday and we are being urged to make our own until more stock is sourced. Children under the age of 12 are exempt, along with those with an illness, condition or disability, which makes wearing a face mask unsuitable. And if your workplace involves teaching, lecturing or broadcasting, you don't need to wear a mask at home while swimming, eating or drinking if you're driving alone or in police custody. And if you're caught without one, you could cop an on-the-spot fine of $1,000. A 41-year-old Ellenbrook man has already been charged after refusing police directions to wear a mask at a shopping centre today. He is now behind bars. Michael. It's a tough lesson to learn. Bon, thank you. Seven homes have been destroyed in a monster blaze east of Perth and firefighters are warning there could be more losses to come. They say the nightmare conditions are so dangerous residents shouldn't stay to defend their homes. Ferocious and out of control. Decimating homes and livelihoods in Wooraloo. Unconfirmed reports, seven homes lost. A fire truck destroyed, others damaged. Firefighters injured on the job, suffering minor burns and smoke inhalation. This is a fast moving fire, it's, it's moving at 2.2 k's an hour at the moment. The blaze started around midday, tearing through paddocks and jumping over roads. Strong southeasterly winds fanning the flames at a rapid pace, burning through more than 1,600 hectares. We came outside and we, then we saw it heading towards us. We had no, no notifications, no nothing. Residents defending their homes with hoses and makeshift water tankers. How do you feel about this so close to your home? Frightening. <laughs> We've got a lot of friends around, but we've got a lot of help. Firefighters were throwing everything at it, but still unable to get the better of this unpredictable blaze. We are pleading that people in these areas are, are listening to our uh, warnings and our advices. This is what firefighters are up against at the moment. Strong winds, poor visibility and spot fires starting everywhere. This blaze 
only started about five minutes ago and look at it now. We've got spot fires up to 400 metres in front of the head fire and it's going, getting into some nasty terrain now. And a bleak forecast ahead as firefighters continue to battle this into the night. We've got crews trying to protect their structures and, and now we've gone into protecting life as well. Don't think you can stay home and defend in this fire. And Cayman Glock is in the fire zone tonight, Cayman. Disturbingly, firefighters say some residents aren't listening to their warnings. Michael, firefighters tell me far too many people are ignoring the warnings, walking and driving around their properties when they should be sheltering inside their homes. Uh, more people have stayed than they would have liked and they've decided to stay when it was by the, now that it's too, when it was safe. Bef, sorry. More people ha, than they would have liked have stayed instead of leaving when it was safe to do so and that is posing a risk to people's lives. An extra 60 appliances have arrived to tackle this blaze well into the night as they prepare for uh, difficult and steep terrain in this rapidly moving fire. Michael? Cayman, thank you for the update. A tropical storm lashing WA's north could reach cyclone intensity on Wednesday and Shirley Biggs, there's a chance we might feel the remnants here in Perth. Well, coming off the back of our driest January in seven years, Tomo, we can only hope that we get a good dousing of rain in February and it's looking likely for this weekend. Now, this is how the system will track over the next 72 hours. It will remain a tropical low over land until Wednesday, uh, heading offshore and developing into a Category 1 system in the afternoon. It's still expected to pack winds to 100 kilometres an hour for a warning area from Mardi to Ningaloo, including Onslow and Exmouth, an isolated daily rainfall totals to 200 millimetres. Then it will turn back on itself and track southeast toward the west coast. Now most models are showing that the system will head straight over Perth through Saturday and Sunday bringing some very heavy rainfall. Perth on the other hand is currently enduring a low intensity heat wave. We reached a top of 37 degrees today and a few more hot days to get through before a cool change arrives Tomo and it's looking like a very wet weekend ahead so I'll have some details coming up soon. That's great. Love a summer storm. Sherry, thank you. Next, the guidelines for exercising during WA snap lockdown explained, plus the rush to evacuate Perth's favourite holiday island. A car parking bonus for workers in the city. Britain's pandemic hero, Sir Tom Moore, struck down with COVID-19. And later, Premier Mark McGowan joins us live with the latest. We have new guidelines tonight for exercising during WA's SNAP lockdown. The Premier has clarified residents can only move around within a five kilometre radius of their homes and must wear a mask at all times. As it stands, we're allowed one hour each day to exercise and we can do it with just one other adult. Parents are also being reassured children are exempt from the one person rule. Holidaymakers are flooding back from Rottnest after the island was evacuated. Accommodation has been closed and ferry services halted until Friday with extra services put on yesterday to get travellers home. Workers have also been told to return to the mainland. We were literally just like chilling in our rooms because we're locals, we live on the island and like we were due to work in like an hour before we found out. And, and all then, of a sudden yeah. it just came out of nowhere, you know, everyone started panicking a little bit and it was just crazy. Travellers are able to rebook or they can get a refund. The Morrison government will start the political year by ending wage subsidies and beginning the rollout of the COVID vaccine. The Prime Minister has also inched closer to an ambitious pledge of cutting Australia's carbon emissions to zero. It sits at the top of this year's to-do list for Scott Morrison. Suppress the virus and deliver the vaccine. And it's no small task. This will be one of the largest logistics exercises ever seen in Australia. Buying vaccines and rolling them out will cost over $6 billion and the aim was to dose frontline workers and the most vulnerable from the end of this month. We're on track for the February commencement, the October completion. But with drug giants under immense pressure to deliver the jab to the world and supply chains buckling, the Prime Minister has started to hedge on that timetable. As quickly as possible, building towards protecting the entire community by the end of this year. 
it's too slow for Labor. We're one week down from the TGA giving their approval to the Pfizer vaccine and we're still none the clearer about when injections will start going into arms. The government's plan for bypassing global demand rests on the yet to be approved AstraZeneca vaccine that will be made in Melbourne and CSL should be able to deliver a million doses a week by the end of March. Securing our own sovereign supply of vaccines. But as the vaccine rolls out, the billions spent on wage subsidies and enhanced unemployment benefits will dry up. You can't run the Australian economy on taxpayers' money forever. The Prime Minister's plan for recovery rests on delivering affordable and reliable energy and he's pledging to do that while edging ever closer to a much more ambitious stance on tackling climate change. Our goal is to reach net zero emissions as soon as possible and preferably by 2050. If he wants to commit to net zero emissions, he should just say so. It will be a long year that will test the endurance of Scott Morrison and his ministers. Chris Yulman, Nine News. All City of Perth car parks are now free of charge in an effort to help essential workers. Car parks without boom gates currently have 24-7 access and you don't need to buy a ticket. If there is a boom gate, you'll still need to buy a ticket. Oh, sorry get a ticket. However, there'll be no fee payable when you leave. These changes will remain in place until the end of lockdown. World War II veteran Captain Sir Tom Moore is in hospital tonight after testing positive to COVID-19. The 100-year-old's daughter confirmed her father was also receiving treatment for pneumonia over the past few weeks. He's needed additional help breathing but is not in intensive care. To finance now, and after a slow start, the local market rallied to gain more than half a percent before the day's close. Blackmores was among the standouts, while the banks were also among the winners. And our dollar is buying a touch over 76 US cents. Next, Premier Mark McGowan live with the latest as day one of lockdown comes to an end. How businesses are coping and adapting their trade. Australians caught up in a shock military coup. And Eddie Maguire speaks out over the racism shame that's rocked Collingwood. Nine News, brought to you by the Ford Ranger Wild Track X. Live the Ranger life. Two new locations have been added to the list of sites a COVID security worker visited while infected. The number of hot zones now totalling 19. Premier Mark McGowan now joins us. Premier, thank you so much for your time. That's a lot of places in a short amount of time. Are you angry the worker wasn't tested when he initially phoned in sick? Well, I think that's a lesson to all of us. Uh, if you're sick, get tested. If you feel any sort of symptoms of anything, get tested. Uh, if you live or go to any of those venues, get tested. Uh, we need a lot of testing to go on over the coming week to make sure that we, are, uh, we clear ourselves and we crush the virus. Why haven't hotel security guards been immediately restricted from working a second job? We've been working on that now for a period of time. Uh, it's been a complex issue, but we expect we'll get to a resolution uh, next week. Uh, and that will involve a significant pay increase for people uh, who are on the front line in hotel quarantine. Uh, but it hasn't been easy. Uh, there's lots of complexity around it, uh, but we expect we'll get to a, a resolution next week. OK. What's behind the decision to keep the schools closed, even to essential workers and their children? Well, it was a five-day lockdown. Uh, we had to make very quick decisions. Uh, we expect schools will reopen uh, next week, but it was basically the first day of term yesterday for the vast majority of schools. Uh, it was the quickest and easiest and cleanest solution to a difficult problem. Um, but uh, clearly, uh, our expectation will be that schools open again next week. All right, that's very encouraging news. Now, we saw some positive numbers today, but are you preparing for the worst? Well, obviously, we want to crush the virus. Uh, if we get cases, we'll have to reconsider what we do in coming weeks. Uh, but we want to crush the virus. We've seen what Adelaide did, what Brisbane has done, what Melbourne has done. That's the right model. Uh, we've got to ensure that we rid ourselves of the virus as quickly as possible so we save lives and we save jobs. And uh, it's very, very unfortunate and very regrettable what's going on this week. And I know that, that will cause a lot of difficulties for many people. But I think it's the right course um, that we've taken in order to deal with the problem immediately. Premier Mark McGowan, we appreciate your time this evening. Thank you, Michael.
Business owners are hoping the five-day lockdown isn't extended as they count the cost of lost trade, but many still support the SNAP restrictions, hoping they prevent even wider pain. Another lockdown and another blow for businesses. Non-essential retail told to shut up shop, restaurants restricted to takeaway only and gyms out of the question. We're paying full wages from Monday to Friday. If it goes beyond that, we'll need to reassess, but we want to make sure our team's looked after first and foremost. Business owners have been here before. Leadable's Queen of Leeds would usually be packed. Instead, only a handful of customers got a Monday morning coffee fix. For the most part, probably down, I'm guessing about 80, 85%. Maybe more. Urban records will rely on online trade. Probably about 70 per cent uh, still in store. So, yeah, it will be a tough week, no doubt. While WA chain Best Body Physio and Pilates hopes the lockdown won't last any longer than the planned five days. And financially, it's uh, definitely be over a six figure blow particularly with the commitment we, we make to looking after our team. The Chamber of Commerce and Industry says the five-day lockdown will cost businesses big, with retail, hospitality and the arts the hardest hit. But it supports the lockdown, saying it's short-term pain for long-term gain. The important thing here is that the lockdown is as short as possible. If we go hard early, hopefully we get to a point where we can put our economy back up. Brittany Hoskins, Nine News. Australian citizens have been tracked by a shock military coup in Myanmar, with leaders of the South East Asian country rounded up in rage. The Morrison government is joining the United States, leading calls for the restoration of democracy in the troubled nation. The army is claiming the government ignored widespread voter fraud, but haven't provided any proof. Eddie Maguire is defending Collingwood's culture after a bombshell report found there is systemic racism within the club. There are demands tonight for the outgoing Pies president to stand down immediately. They say side by side, but Collingwood now has a documented racism divide. The report leaked and Eddie was in damage control. This is an historic and proud day for the Collingwood Football Club. The Do Better report, which Collingwood commissioned itself, finding the club's response to racism has been at best ineffective or at worst exacerbated the impact, including claims some players were punished for complaining. We have built a fantastic club. There are plenty of things at the moment you look back on and you go, gee, I wish we could have done those better. The report also revealing, as one person we spoke to said, if you look at every high-profile incident of racism in the game, Collingwood is there somewhere. The report finding something former player Haritia Lumumba says vindicate him of complaints of racism at the Pies. Remarks about black penises, whether they were jokes that were um, that were reinforcing racial stereotypes. This is about a culture that has racism woven into it. We want to engage with Haritia. He's one of our guys. OK? He doesn't feel that at the moment. It breaks our heart. Lumumba's comments at odds with those of players leaving training this afternoon. There's always areas we can get better. I think we're in a we're in a in that space where we're trying to learn as each day goes through. It was racial abuse from Collingwood fans that provoked Nicky Winmar's infamous on-field moment. Laura Turner, Nine News. Ahead, everything you need to know about the COVID vaccine rollout. Your questions answered in a special medical report. But first, it's time for sport with Matthew Pavlich and Pav. Plenty of changes for our teams. Yeah, it's COVID chaos, Tomo, with players and coaches forced out of town. As the Wildcats sub out of Perth for an extended period. Leighton warns rougher to watch out ahead of a cup grunt match. And the Wizards leave the NBA world spellbound. The Wildcats have embarked on the longest road trip in club history. Tonight in Sydney, in a desperate attempt to keep the NBL season going, WA sporting teams thrown into disarray with a week of lockdown ahead. A fast break out of Perth for two months away is a new experience for even the most seasoned travellers. A little bit different, mate, but you got to do what you got to do, huh? The Wildcats forced to pivot on their original plan of landing in Melbourne. Blocked by the Victorian government, they're now benched in Sydney, away from the Red Army, family and friends. Yeah, pretty tough for the kids, but it's what you got to do, isn't it? The Scorchers embracing Thursday's Manica Oval final with Brisbane after plans were scrapped to play it in Perth. 
obviously we understand that there's bigger things happening at home than, than Big Bash cricket. The AFLW season in chaos with the Eagles and Dockers round two games postponed. The Giants and Crows now isolating after returning home from weekend matches in WA. Had a COVID test um, at the football club. They'd set up a marquee and we could drive through. Dockers captain Nat Fife and James H getting to work under new restrictions. While WA teams can only train for an hour with one teammate, it's business as usual for the Vicks. Perth Glory's clash with the Reds in Adelaide on Thursday will go ahead, but the women's double header in Melbourne is on hold. Perth Heat's upcoming four-game series with the Melbourne Aces hangs in the balance, and all racing, pacing and chasing meetings and trials are off. Successful last year, strict biosecurity protocols are being implemented in the hope of resuming midweek racing in Geraldton. Paddy Sweeney, Nine News. Buddy Franklin's horror run with injury is continuing, with the Swan Star now grounded by a calf issue suffered at training. Coach John Longmire conceding he's now unlikely to play in round one. Buddy's only managed ten games in the past two seasons. Australia captain Leighton Hewitt has warned Alex Dimonor will be holding nothing back in tomorrow night's ATP Cup showdown with Spain. The world number 23 is ready for a blockbuster rematch with Rafael Nadal. On the eve of their cup campaign, Australia's spearhead reacquaints himself with Rod Laver Arena. Just really getting used to the conditions. Uh, this is when our match time is going to be scheduled for tomorrow night. And obviously, pretty tough opener against Spain. Alex Dimonor and John Millman appearing relaxed with opponents watching on. The Aussie captain eager to let Dimonor loose in a repeat of last year's semi final defeat to the world number two. Alex is a better player now than he was then. Yeah, he's going to be confident out here. We know how big a task it is, but uh, he'll certainly leave it all out here. Earlier, Nick Kyrgios sweated it out with his Australian Open preparations beginning tomorrow, while today Serena Williams showed she hasn't lost her touch. Oh, it's lovely to watch. The 39-year-old dropping just a game in her opening set against Daria Gavrilova, storming into the second round of the Summer Series warm-up event. <laughs> That's the way to finish it off. Isla Tom Lanovich appeared in control of her clash with Elise Cornet, but trailing a set, France's world number 53 took over, winning the next two, 6-1, 6-3. Oh, disappointing end to the game and the match for Isla Tom Lanovich. Bernard Tomic taking to a different court after pulling the pin on tonight's leading match, citing a knee complaint. Joshua Dor, Nine News. NBA cellar dwellers, the Washington Wizards, have pulled off a miracle upset over Brooklyn. Trailing the Nets by five with 10 seconds left, stars Bradley Beal and Russell Westbrook hit consecutive threes to steal victory. In Indiana, Ben Simmons helped the 76ers erase a 20-point deficit, scoring 21 in Philly's 119-110 to win over the Pacers. And Patrick Reid has put his cheating controversy to one side with a big PGA Tour win. Despite the runaway victory, Reid is again under fire from rival players. The furor erupting when the American claimed a free drop for an embedded ball, which he moved before an official had a chance to inspect it. Obviously, the talk amongst the boys isn't uh, great, I guess, but um, he's protected by the tour, and, and all, that's all that matters, I guess. Reid insists he did everything by the book. He claimed victory by five strokes. A few players not so happy yes. there. Winning, but not popular, Tomo. Pav, thank you. All right, next, the burning questions on the COVID vaccine. A must-watch medical report to protect your family, plus the dangerous snowstorm impacting 110 million residents. And the film festival on a remote island with an audience of one. Welcome back. Let's take a look at the biggest stories making news in Perth this evening. WA has recorded no new coronavirus cases as the state completes its first day of a five-day snap lockdown. Residents of a Maylands apartment complex are outraged, saying they were left in the dark about the outbreak. Nurses are pushing for 24-hour testing clinics as thousands of West Australians brave the heat to get checked. And homes have been destroyed in a monster bushfire in Woolloo. In Perth's east, firefighters will work into the night to save houses. Well, a cloud of confusion and uncertainty has been cast over Australia's COVID vaccine rollout. 
Alicia Loxley has broken down how to protect your family and the people you love. The COVID vaccine is almost here, but with its arrival comes many questions. First and foremost, when will I get it? Well, if you live or work in aged care, frontline health or hotel quarantine, you're first in line and the end of February is looking like the start date. The aim is for 80,000 jabs per week. Now, last in the queue are healthy adults under the age of 50 who are not in high-risk settings. You will probably have to wait until the middle of the year. Is it safe? The TGA, our regulator, says the Pfizer jab is safe. It's given it provisional approval for people 16 years and over and will carry out batch testing and close monitoring as it's rolled out. What are the side effects? They are short-term, but worse, we're told, than from the annual flu jab. A majority likely to be fatigued and suffer headaches more than a third will have muscle pain and chills, while joint pain is also possible but less likely. Who can't have the jab? At this stage, children, and it's also not recommended for pregnant women. Which vaccine will I get? Well, Pfizer's is the only one approved for use here in Australia, and we've only ordered 10 million doses. Everyone needs two at least three weeks apart, so that's five million Australians covered, meaning the general population is unlikely to get the Pfizer jab. Most Australians will probably get the Oxford AstraZeneca jab, and we've got a deal for more than 50 million doses. How effective is it? Well, the efficacy does vary. The Pfizer vaccine protects 94.5% of people from developing COVID, while AstraZeneca's protects 70% on average. Its efficacy rose to 90% for people in the trial, given a half dose first and then a full one. It's also important to note the flu jab only prevents illness about 60% of the time. How much will it cost? Well, no matter which one you get, it will be free. And the goal is for the entire population to be vaccinated by October. More than 110 million Americans will be impacted as a winter blast moves from the Midwest to the East Coast. The storm is causing havoc on the roads with this fire truck flipping in Virginia. Washington, D.C. has been blanketed, triggering the Capitol Police to ban sledding over security and COVID-19 concerns. But that memo didn't get to the pandas at the National Zoo, who were caught on camera playing in the snow and having a ball too. A binge-watching haven has been set up for a Swedish nurse who'll spend an entire week on a remote island. The healthcare worker will get a much-needed break from the COVID frontline after winning a competition to watch all 70 movies submitted to the Gothenburg Film Festival. You'd have to be a movie lover. Shirley Biggs is back with all of your weather details. Sherry, another hot day tomorrow. Yes, well, we're heading for a top of 37 degrees before it cools down by the end of the week. Tomo, I'll have all the details coming up after the break. Welcome back. Well, strong winds this morning paired with today's heat created dangerous fire conditions and we can expect much of the same tomorrow. It reached 37 degrees mid-afternoon. That sea breeze didn't quite make it into the city today, so it is still hovering around 33. But if we take a look at the map, while we wait for potential cyclone Marion to form, the Pilbara and West Kimberley have been pummeled overnight. We saw 120 millimetres fall Derby's way and with isolated totals likely to exceed 200 mil this week. There is flood warnings in place for the Fitzroy and De Grey River catchments and the Sandy Desert and Pilbara catchments. But taking a look at the rest of the country, a morning storm in Sydney, 24 degrees. Some patchy cloud about Melbourne, a cool top of 19 and cloud is clearing in Adelaide, a top of 25 degrees. To WA now and today we learned that Broome experienced its hottest January on record. The warmest January days though felt in 30 years and the warmest nights since records began. Tomorrow Tomorrow they're expecting just a top of 32 degrees but if we take a look south now plenty of blue sky except for the central west and wheat belt where we could see some storms not much rain though if they do eventuate and we're heading for 36 degrees in Geraldton. Looking around Perth now and gusty easterlies in the morning about the hills Midland is heading for 38 degrees while our coastal suburbs will be treated to a sea breeze so a top of 35 degrees in Swanbourne. We'll start with a low of 
23 degrees around the inner city suburbs and a hot top of 37 to follow mid afternoon. And even though it's a warm 34 degrees on Wednesday, this is when we can expect the cool change to come through. So a top of 32 degrees by Thursday, 30 on Friday. And then with the potential remnants of a cyclone moving in over the weekend, we could be adding 20 millimetres to the gauge. It'll be one to watch though, Tomo, because it is still early days, but I'll have all the details this week. We could do with some rain. Cherry, thank you. That's nine news for this Monday. Thanks for your company. A current affair is next. Enjoy your evening. Good night.